All right, so, Father, we just want to honor and bless you this evening as we come to learn from you. Teach us your ways, Lord. There are many ways that you give us grace to understand our authority in the kingdom. When it comes to this reality, Lord, the whole idea of why you created us to communicate with you, really just settle that inside of us and change us as we listen to this, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. All right, so I will always do this with you guys. Uh, first, I always have to remind you, please go to our website, sign up, get our email sent to you. We have, I'm trying to think, we have our YouTube channel that I've been posting on every week now for the last couple months. The last video I did, I think, was uh, Discovering God as a Father. So if you're interested in that, please go ahead and check that out. Um, sign up for our newsletter. We'll give you a free audio, and then we have all kinds of other free things that we have on there because our goal, if you can imagine, is to equip you guys to do the work of the ministry. All right, with that being said, we are now here teaching on prayer. I think I've asked you guys, so I'll do it again as we always do this. How many of you have had any training on prayer? Seminars, read books on it, any of that kind of stuff? Okay, so... That was kind of an interesting response, but let's go ahead and go forward. Because everyone just kind of went, well, so, prayer. The, there's a couple things that we have to discover as we're going through this course. Um, one of them is actually, why should we even do this in the first place? If we're relating to the God of the universe, doesn't he sit above time, know every event that's going to happen, and does he really answer prayers? I mean, really, what, we have to answer that question. Why do we need to do this if God knows all these? And, you're, and you guys will actually find out that Jesus actually addresses this. Uh, he, he explains why you should pray, how long you should pray, and the focus of prayer. But, again, if you've never had a chance to study that or look at it or understand what he's after, most of the time people are just like, uh, prayer feels like it's just this thing that I do. So what we always do is before we get into this specific teaching I'm going to cover, we have to kind of just do a real quick review. And we always have to go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 27. Okay, now what's going on in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27? It's not a passage actually on prayer. It's, a, it's the passage of God creating you and I in his image. So here God is creating everything. And then he's making his his representatives, remember, we are representing him. That's why we were created and put on the planet. Um, and so we're image bearers. Because we are image bearers, uh, God makes a couple of statements in Genesis chapter 26 and 27 about what he's going to confer on us as image bearers while we are on this planet. The one thing that you guys need to see in this passage is that God makes mankind, men and women, the legal authority on this planet. You are you were given legal authority. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse um, 26 and 27, God says we've made man in our image. And then he says, and we it says that he has given us dominion. Now when it says he gave us, in fact I'm going to quote it correctly, we've made man in our image and our likeness, let them rule. So they are going to rule. And then he talks about all of creation they're going to have um, authority over. And then it says that um, he created them both male and female, and it goes into the difference between um, um, being made and created, which I will explain here in a moment. But when he said, let them have dominion, that is a statement that lawyers make in the Old Testament. It carries a legal authority. So it literally means that even though God actually is sovereign, he actually has the ability to do whatever he wants, he has determined that the activities on this planet are left in the hands of men and women, the legal authority. So God can't do anything on the planet just because he wants to. He has to find someone on the planet that comes into agreement with him because you're the legal authority for him to do something on the planet. The enemy cannot do whatever he wants on the planet either. He has to find someone that comes into agreement with him on something before he can express his um, illegal authority on the planet, right? So when people say, well, yeah, we gave all the dominion back to the devil. No, what we did is we, we, we actually gave him our position of authority, and then we decided to come into alignment with him. That's it. We're born with his 
nature of rebellion instead of the nature of wanting to follow the Lord. All right? So it's easy for him to exert his will because from childbirth, uh, rebellion is in the hearts of people. But men and women are created in the image to be the legal authority of whatever needs to be expressed on earth. God does it through mankind. That should bless you or upset you or something else like that. <laughs> but with that statement being made right here, if this doesn't settle why you should pray, which I'm going to try to settle it for you, all the other statements on how to pray aren't going to make sense. God has determined that you, you, decide how much of heaven or how much of hell you want in your life by how you come into agreement with the spirit realm. And the idea of being neutral, just so we understand, there is no neutrality. You, you really are either in agreement with the kingdom of God or in the, the agreement of the kingdom of darkness. It's not, I don't, I'm not going to make a decision, so I don't, this doesn't matter. You are either in one alignment or another. It, there is no, well, I, I'm not going to pay attention, so it doesn't matter. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. So you have to decide, one, to understand this, and two, how to exercise legal authority properly. This is this idea that you can just do it any old way you want. That's not how God has set up the universe or how he's determined that he's going to govern. And if we're image bearers, there's an order and a wisdom to how God does stuff. Since you're made in his image, you, he has an order and a wisdom on how to do these things. Does that make sense to you guys? All right, so this is always the foundation of why we should pray. Why should we pray? Well, this is the foundation right here. Now, if this is true, which it is, if you look at Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus is teaching on prayer, he says, pray this way. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done. Why are we asking God to let his will be done if he could do whatever he wants whenever he wants to? Because we're showing that Jesus is even teaching. That's not the way it works. You have to find someone that's going to say, okay, we see what you want to do on the earth. I say yes to it, so express it. Yeah. Yeah. That's why he tells you to pray this way every day. Um, now, with that being said... That's the foundation of all of this. Well, I'll actually answer, but can you give me a sec? Okay, thank you. All right, so what we did is we started last month explaining the reality of what the kingdom of God is like. And so we started talking about how does God's kingdom work and how God works. And we didn't get very far because it, it takes a long time to work through all that. So we're now going to begin to address this idea that if we have legal authority, how does power and authority work in the kingdom of God. So here we are. You and I were created in the image of God to ex exercise, not just exercise physically, but exercise power, and we're designed the way that God has created. He's designed us to manage power and authority. So when you are, this idea that, in, do you know why being a victim or being taken advantage of, and do you understand why mankind, every man and woman longs for freedom? It's because this is the way God has made you. You were made to exercise power, exercise authority, and have dominion over the world that God has created you to live in. That's your natural, that's his, the way that God has made you. So you weren't put on this planet to be victim, victimized. You were not put on the planet to be taken advantage of. You weren't put on the planet to be the doormat of anybody. You were put on the planet to have dominion. This is why people want this. This is why they long for it. And everyone acts like this is an evil thing. This is how God has intentionally made you. Now the question becomes, there are two ways that people manage power and authority. There's the way the world does it, which is in alignment with the devil, basically. And there's the way the kingdom of God does it. And it aligns with the Lord. So this is what we have to begin to understand. Okay. When in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and uh, 27 specifically, it says, God created man, created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So it says that um, in Genesis 26, let us make, let us make. So he uses the word make and create. So let's go ahead and why does this need to be emphasized? Because this will help you understand how authority works. Why does the Hebrew word actually give us two distinct Hebrew words for the word make and create? All right. And this is going to help you with your prayer life, hopefully. It helped me when I say it. So if I can communicate it well enough, it'll help you. The word create is the word, uh, I'll go ahead and write it up here. It's B-A-R-A, -A, bara, 
and it means to create out of a non-physical reality. So when, when God created man, this part of man, this is the non-physical part of man. This is called the spiritual realm or the soul, all right? Okay, so God created you to have a soul or a spirit. Right? Not created out of anything he's already made. It's created from him. Because it is spiritual, it, it is created to relate to the realm it's created from. So you are, you, you guys ever hear, you ever hear us talk to each other in the body of Christ? We say, you're so spiritual. Well, the reality of it is, is you're so spiritual whether you ever realize it or not because you have this part of you. And because you were created spiritually, you're, you're in the spirit 24-7. Now, and there are references in the scripture where John says, I was in the spirit, right? And so everyone thinks, oh, so I can go in and out of the spirit. No, what he's trying to communicate is I felt the presence of the Lord. That's what it means to be in the spirit. But you were created to relate to the spirit realm. In fact, people do this all the time, 24-7. So thoughts come to your head is come to your head and when you say yes to it or you come into agreement with it depending on the source of that thought you connect with one or two kingdoms all right so do you guys uh you've heard me do this one but if you don't i'll just give you a reference to this jesus is taking uh gosh because i remember the story but not the exact uh, uh address i'm not going to get it right but when jesus is talking about um you're going to give an account for every word that you say is that matthew chapter 7 i think it is if it isn't, just forgive me and trust me that I'm quoting the right thing to you. When Jesus says that you'll give an account for every word, uh, you know, the word it's talking about there is rhema. You're going to give an account for every rhema you speak. Well, why, is he, why do you have to be held accountable for rhemas? Because rhema is the idea that spiritual thoughts are coming to you. You speak them out, and depending where the source of that thought comes from, it releases that power dynamic of that source of thought into the physical world that you live in. Matthew 12, 36. 12, 36? Thank you. So when it says, I'll give an account of that, it's just for every idle word. It's idle, but the idea of idle, I don't think it's idle word. Uh, yeah, so the idea isn't that it's uh, telling jokes, you're going to have to give an account for every joke you tell. The, the word idle means you're not paying attention to it. So it's a word that comes to you, a rhema. The, the word is rhema that's being used there. It's coming, you don't recognize the source of it, and as you speak it, it releases from whatever source it comes from into the world that you live in. It's like a form of coming into agreement. That's why you have to be held accountable for it. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Yeah. But this isn't coming out of your own soul. This is thoughts coming to you. You don't realize the source it's coming from, and you come into agreement, and you speak it into a situation. Whatever source, whether it's good or evil, whatever source it comes from, and you speak it, it releases that power into a situation. Not, not every word. So it's only rhemas. Please understand that. They're spiritual words, okay? So if I say the Broncos stink, yeah. I do not have to stand before the Lord when I die and give an account for that <gasps> because that's not think? no. And so, <laughs> go ahead. Could you say that what you said about agreeing or something? What you yeah. said before? Yeah. Sure. So when we're taught this in Matthew 24, Jesus is saying when thoughts that you're not paying attention to come from the spirit realm because you're created in the image of God. When you speak it or come into agreement with it, it releases the power, the source of the power that comes from that into the physical world because you're the legal represent, you're the legal authority to do that. That's why you're held accountable for it. That's why there are people that don't know the Lord at all, that the Lord gives them a thought and they prophesy to you and you're like, oh my gosh, the Lord spoke to me through that person. It's because they didn't know where the thought came from, but they came to agreement with it and they spoke it. Right? So, yes. Here, you have some Christians that get a little woo woo about stuff and then they're like, their arms like falling off and they're like, oh, I'm healed of the Lord. Yeah, but that's, do you, so there's a distinction. Be, so the reality is, uh, let me back up and try it another way. Are you ready, Mimi? The problem isn't 
that. The problem is, is that they're not getting a word from the Lord. They're just speaking out of their own soul. So they don't know how to recognize the source of the thought that just came to them. They think, all I have to do is read it. It happened 2,000 years ago, so I'm going to come into agreement what I heard 2,000 years ago. This is a specific rhema. That, the word rhema means a now living word for the situation. It's not a password that was spoken. It's a now living word in the situation. And it comes from either the kingdom of darkness or the, or the Lord. Does that help? Oh, I can, yes, I see Jesus can heal, but I can prophesy, I mean, sorry, I can speak to my arm all day long, but until the Lord speaks to me and says, now you speak to your arm, it doesn't get healed. All right, so let me say it this way. Are you ready? You, when you have thoughts come to your head, no matter how you respond to them emotionally, because of situations, you always have to test and weigh the source of it. Did that come from the Lord? Or is that, did that come from me? Or did that come from the enemy? Does that help? That helps work through all of that stuff. Um, do you guys understand the principle so far? So here I am in the physical, assume I'm in the spirit and I'm talking to her spirit. The enemy can come up and look at a situation and say a bunch of stuff at you because he can observe what's going on. And you think that's your thought because he's observing or, or there might be a demonic spirit that's watching you for a season and they come up and then they lie to you about something to get you to come into agreement with it. It doesn't mean they have to know any of your they can just observe the situation and speak to you. You've had a child, right? So remember when they were an infant and they were like one or two and stuff and you're around them all the time, so you observed them and everything, and just by the nuances of their expression and how they did things, you could figure out what they were thinking? Mm -hmm. Well, the enemy watches, I mean, what does he have to do, really, 24-7? He watches people all the time. So he watches you be afraid of stuff. He doesn't need to know you're afraid. He can just observe your, uh, I mean, seriously, the guy's been around for, what, seven or 8,000 years. All he does is just observe humanity all the time, him and all these stupid demons. And so they don't need to know any of your thoughts. They figured out the human race. And really, actually, their, their assignment is pretty ridiculous. Once you've got it figured out, you think, then this has worked millennial after millennial? Yeah. It's amazing how simple things that we're all worried about are all lies. And yet we believe them. It's, it's amazing how silly it is. So it doesn't matter if they know you're afraid of something or not. They're going to harass you because they're always looking for weakness. So when they find a weakness, then they start a conversation with you about your weakness. Either they accuse you of it or they try to fuel it. They don't even, know what, they don't even need to know what your thoughts are. This is why, why are we doing demonization? This is why when people get in car accidents or they observe families and the way they interact, this is why they attack people in the family because you've grown up in a dysfunctional environment, the enemy has fueled a lot of stuff, and then after he gets done with them, he just harasses you with it. Okay. Um, so let's take the word made. So we're created. That means 24-7 we are in the spirit realm. What does it mean to be made? Well, the Hebrew word is asa. Ah, ah, it's A-S-A. And this actually means to be created from something already made. So this is the idea that God takes dirt that he's already created and forms an image of something in it. And so this is from creation. Okay, now, why do we need to know the distinction? So um, just so you guys know this about yourself, you already can perceive, but if you've not had someone say it to you, I'm going to say it to you. You have a physical body that's relating to the physical realm 24-7. Now, most people, because this is a duality that's going on inside of you, they think that this is on all the time, but you enter in and out of this. But that's not a reality. You're actually in this all the time, too. So you're a unique creation. You're not like the angels, and you're not like any animal on the earth. You're created by the Lord to represent him spiritually, and he gives you a physical body to relate to the physical world that he's put you in. So you're unique. They're, they're, that's why, um, be careful because I, I get kind of nasty when I say this. This is why ev evolution, as we've learned about it today in science classes, is such an insult to you. You're not an animal that's evolved into a spiritual being. I mean, really, Darwin should have been just taken out and slapped. I mean, the guy is just an idiot. But anyways, well, I mean, he is. I mean, it's just silly. What do you, <clears throat> anyways. So you, now, when it says, just so you guys understand this, when it says that God breathed the breath of life into mankind, he, that, he wasn't breathing the spirit into him. The word breathe in Hebrew in that passage is really important. It means to integrate. 
So you have a spirit and you have a physical body. When God breathed into you, he created perfect integration to where they can function 24-7 with each other. So I can be in the spirit and in the physical realm. So when God says something, I can speak it into the physical realm. There's not a disconnect. I'm a whole being that he's created me. I'm integrated. So when he breathed the breath of life into mankind, the word breathe means to integrate into wholeness. So you're never not a spiritual being and not a physical being. In fact, do you understand what death is? Death is either spiritual, means I don't know the Lord, that's what death is, or I die physically in my physical body, which means my soul is separated from my body. To be alive and being created in the image of God, I have to have the spirit and the body fully integrated with itself. Yes? So, when you're, before you're born again, yes. then your spirit is like... Separated from God. But not necessarily in one kingdom or another? Oh no, you're in the kingdom of darkness. Oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's no doubt about that. You're in the kingdom. Of, that's why it says that you're taken out of the kingdom of darkness and put in the kingdom of his dear son. You, you're not, it, people think when Jesus says you're, yeah, when Jesus says you're born again, everyone thinks that's, you get the spirit. That's not what happens. It means spiritual death in one sense of the word in the Bible means spiritually you're dead under relationship with God. When, he, when you're born again, you're born into relationship with him again. But you're not given a spirit at that point. You already have a spirit. This is why people that don't know the Lord can channel evil spirits and speak for them. You still, you're 24-7 a spiritual being. Now let's take the word image. What does the word image mean? It means a copy of something. It means the characteristic or the essence of something. So when we say we are image bearers, this is why we're unique in God's creation. This is why prayer is so powerful is because you're a copy of God on earth. It's hard to say that to people. You're the image of God on earth. Even in your fallen state, you're still the image of God. There's nothing like you. And now there's millions of us or billions of us running around on the planet, but in the created order of everything that God has created, there's nothing like us in the universe. Nothing. Nothing else is an image bearer, only us. This is why when you're told that your ancestors are apes or baboons or rocks or nothing, it's an, it's an insult to you. It really is. It's kind of insulting to be told you're dirt. Mm -hmm. or, fish. <laughs> or fish or whatever it is. So now, you guys ready? Because you're an image bearer, God created what's called a ruling class that he holds responsible for the affairs of the earth, and that's you. So when everybody says, the devil made me do it, the devil might have given you the idea, but because you are made in the image of God, you ultimately have to choose to do both good and evil. You're never let go of the responsibility of it. Uh, that's why uh, you can't, you know, that, that thing we always say, well, the devil made me do it, and everyone thinks that's a free pass before the Lord. The devil doesn't have, the, I, I how do I say this? The devil really... Uh, still has to work with you. He's not in the same creation you are. To get you to sin, he has to trick you or can lie to you or convince you. But you make the decision. You are a free agent to make these decisions about things. Free agent up to a certain point. I have to be careful how I say that. So, because, now the reason why I say it, I had to put a limit on that is because after Adam, everyone was born into sin. So it's their nature to rebel until they get redeemed again. But even in your nature to rebel, you do not have to sin. It is your choice to do it. Isn't that fun to say that to a group of people? Now, that actually should, that should actually liberate you because that actually means that the Bible is going to come to you. Isn't it funny? We're talking about prayer, but the Bible has to comes to you and says, do you not understand the order of how God has created you? You are this unique creation. That's why the enemy wants to use you to abuse other things because he knows you're the only legal authority on this planet to do his will. If humanity just started rebuking him, this would all, all the evil would stop on the planet. <laughs> it would. He couldn't get in. Demons couldn't get in to do the stuff they wanted to do. Yes. So you're talking about like you have to basically agree with evil. So what about how does sickness play into this? 
Well, sickness is an effect of man's alignment with Satan. But does sickness have authority over you? It feels like it sometimes. Okay. It does and it doesn't. Right? Okay. Ultimately, it doesn't have ultimate authority over you. Okay, and temporally, t in a temporal way, a temporal way, it does and it doesn't. It depends on if you know how to actually exercise authority over sickness. Okay, you're giving me that look. Do you remember when we were covering healing at all? Do you remember when I was covering healing, Mimi? Okay, it's called the chain of sin and the effect of sin. So man sins, right? Then this thing called a chain reaction begins to happen to the human race. Regardless of whether you know this fact or not, it's a reality. When man sins, all of a sudden, discord comes into his existence. Discord. Discord. What that actually means is, we're just going to go through a whole line. Discord starts happening, then disease starts happening, and then destruction. Uh, I'm not spelling it right, but, and then um, death. It's called the chain of sin and the effect of it. Now, question is, is because Adam and Eve, forget about your sin, because Adam and Eve sin, is, or we just have to live with all this? Yes and no. People that are in rebellion to the Lord, this is their life. Discord, uh, dis destruction, disease, and then death, right? They can't ever break free from it. Because it's the effect of the sin and effect. Well, when you get redeemed, right, Jesus buys you back and puts you in his kingdom, do you have to have discord after that? No. But, but you have to learn how to actually have authority over this, right? Do you have to have disease in your life? No. Do you have to have distortion or destruction in your life? And do you have to have death? No. Yes. <laughs> You're going to die. Sorry. <laughs> Ultimately, you won't. All right. Okay, so that's, you have to, well, I'm just going all over the place tonight. Sorry, guys. We're created the image of God. You have to understand these things. What do we have authority over? If you don't think you have authority over this, the enemy will just run and do whatever he wants in any of these areas of your life. But once you realize, wait a minute, I'm the legal authority here. Why am I accepting this? Sin isn't just the idea that you're rebelling against the Lord. Sin has facets, fac, um, facets to it. The first reason that you sin in any area of your life is you've been deceived in that area. So you're living in a form of deception, of thinking. You cannot break free from this. And it ties into your emotions, and it ties into your physiology. And until you realize you're deceived in that area, and that's where God has to bring revelation and light to you, because everyone reads it in Scripture and still says, yeah, but I'm defeated. Until God breaks that, you actually are going to struggle with it, even though you know the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Does that make sense? Is that like stronghold? Uh, stronghold is actually a thought pattern. No, this is why people sin, even after they know Jesus, is because they're deceived. When we say we renew our mind, we are not changing our thoughts. We are learn. No, no. We're learning to address the thoughts. That's what it means to renew the mind. It's not, because you can't, if you think you're going to change the enemy saying things to you because you're reading the scripture, you, that's never going to happen. No, you have to learn to address it. Yeah, I have yeah. to address it, but I have to learn to change myself. You, you only change it in the fact where you say, I'm not going to accept that, and here's the truth. Yeah. Okay, that's the idea. But if you think you're going to get the enemy to quit tempting you about stuff, I, I've had people say, oh, it's like I, I got a breakthrough, and then five years later it all came back again. Well, that shows you you're dealing with a demon. Yeah. That just shows, And they don't care if you've had a victory in a certain season of your life. And, until you learn how to address them, and every time they come in an arena and tell, no, I'm not going to believe that, and here's the truth about it. Until that's settled, they're going to always challenge that because they're liars, they're evil, and, you, and they kind of need to be beaten up in a lot of ways. Spiritually, when Satan was when Satan tempted Jesus, remember, after he had been baptized, he went in the wilderness and stuff. After the three temptations, it says the enemy left him for an opportune time. Mm -hmm. An opportune time is what? Anything. 
when you're at your weakest. He didn't talk to Jesus after he just got done raising 20 people from the dead. He, he was waiting until he was worn down, and then he went after him. Okay, just so, so you guys think through that stuff. Okay, so if you're made in God's image, you are the people that are held responsible to exercise being God's image bearers. God has given you dominion. And so in Genesis, again, where it says he's given us dominion, it's called the transference of authority and power. He's given it to mankind. That's why I think John Wesley, if you know who he is, said he doesn't believe anything happens except by prayer. So I always have people, say, when I say that to them, they say this to me, well, I didn't pray for it, and everyone I know didn't pray for it. But you're assuming God didn't tell someone to pray for that. So think of all the prayer that's going on on the planet right now. Do you think God can put something in someone's heart in Russia to pray for you in a specific way without knowing you to get something covered in your life? Can God manage his kingdom that way? Yes. Yeah, so you, oh, Lee agrees with me. All right, so yeah. think about that with me. I really believe that the, if we're going to bear out this scripture correctly, God just doesn't indiscriminately do stuff. He tells someone, would you come into agreement with me so I can come over here and minister? In fact, that's what intercession is. He's trying to find someone that will agree with him. I want to do something here. Would you agree with me about this? All right. Let's keep moving on. So when he transferred power, this is important that we understand this. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, God cannot violate this statement that he made to mankind when he said, I gave you dominion. That means when man chose to sin, God couldn't come back in and say, well, I'm just taking this authority back. He had to work it through man. That's why Jesus had to come in the flesh. He had to come in the flesh to resolve this because it was given to mankind. Keep moving to the next area of authority that you have. Do you guys realize that you have authority over everything that God created? Yes. Amen. All animals and the earth. So do you guys see in Isaiah where God actually is making a judgment statement on the nation of Israel and he says because of this rebellion it's going to affect your crop. Well why did he connect it like that? <laughs> I'm sorry? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> it's in the first couple chapters because he's talking about judgments and stuff like that. But you can read Amos or any of them. They'll, they'll tell you the land that he's going to deal with the crops because of the rebellion of the people. Um, but why is that? Because you're the legal authority of the planet. Right. You are. It, it's, it's just, it gets hard to say this to a group of people because everyone thinks, no, the Lord is the authority over this. And then they quote the scripture. Uh, they're trying to be right, but it's incorrectly. Well, doesn't the Lord own the cattle on a thousand hills? Well, ultimately, he created them. They're his, but while they're on this planet, you have legal authority over them. <laughs> I don't know why that's so... <laughs> Sovereignty of the Lord, yeah. He's sovereign no matter how rebellious mankind is. Okay, so do you remember my whole discussion that we've been going through this evening? What did God give you dominion over? All animals, too. So you have authority over land, you have authority over animals. Cl uh, Cliff and I were talking about this one time, and he showed me this document that came out of the 1890s from the theologian, where he wrote this whole entire book on learning to speak to weather patterns as a believer, that you actually have authority to do that. And this isn't some little guy that was on a farm. I'm talking about this is a major theologian out of the 1890s that wrote a whole entire book on the miracle of weather patterns and actually have a, how to have authority with them. Because we don't think like this. We're barely, I don't even know if Jesus will heal my runny nose. And this guy's talking about, well, how do you actually have authority? You've been given authority over weather patterns. You need to begin to exercise it. And we're like, what? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to tell you a story here real quick. I love this story because it's awesome. Um, right now on the planet, again, don't assume the world that you live in is the only thing that God's doing on the planet. Outside of Western Christianity, the Lord is moving so powerfully in all the other nations, it's almost scary to go to those nations and then come back here. Yes. Really. Mm -hmm. um, in a, a town in the, Phil the Philippines, Fiji, sorry, Fiji. In Fiji, Adam, he used to be on staff with me, uh, Lee and, and Cliff know who's Adam. He was part of another ministry that was called... Um, transformation something. It was called fusion. And all they did was document world transformation that the Holy Spirit was doing in regions of the world. So they go to Fiji. The, an evangelist had gone down into Fiji and led the chieftain of this one little village to the Lord. And the chieftain declared over his people 
you're all Christians, you need to repent and come to the Lord. So the whole village came to the Lord. All right, so how did they live as a village? They made a covenant with the Lord that every morning, now I'm going to tell you this, don't start doing this. You have to be led by the Lord to do this. This is how the Lord led this village. They wake up at five in the morning every day and they commune with God as a community. They repent of all their sins and they seek the Lord. Wow. All right, that's all they do as a chieftain and everybody in that community. And by the way, it's not some big city. It's not like Denver. This is like a small little community, all right? All right, so they had several problems going on. One was the coral reef had actually been uh, eroded to where no fish were eating off it anymore. And the river that went through town, uh, because of upstream from industrial waste, it, it was toxic. They couldn't ever drink it. All right, now that was the problems that were going on with the earth around them. They're not asking the Lord to heal the coral reef, and they're not asking God to deal with the river. All they're doing is seeking the Lord. Now, do you guys ever seek the Lord and God introduces something in his kingdom to you that you didn't even know was a benefit of walking with Jesus? And you go, why? And then you see it in Scripture and you're like, huh, there it is all the time. Yeah. All right. Now, remember when he says, my people who are called by my name, if they humble, humble themselves, seek my face, I will heal. heal their land. What does that actually mean? Everyone thinks that means just people getting saved. That is not what that means. It means God will heal the land. Okay, so... These guys are seeking the Lord. They don't even realize that's a promise from the Lord. All of a sudden, they, every day, they, the part of their community would go out into the coral reefs, and they'd try to throw nets out to catch fish, which they weren't catching fish. One day, a crew went out there, and a fire came, a um, pillar of fire came out of heaven into the water for 45 minutes and went up and down the coral reef on the boundary lines of that tribe. They literally came out and watched yeah, this is like 10 years ago. <laughs> and so, and this finger, God just went up and down the coral reef and healed it. Now all the fish are eating there. Okay, now it even gets better. Then they started realizing that as they went by the river on the other side of the village, they noticed that it was clean. They're like, well, it used to be filthy. How is it clean? So they actually tested it, found out it was actually the purest drinking water they've ever had. But if they went outside of the boundary of the community, it was polluted. So you guys ready? It was polluted until it reached the boundary mark of that community. Then it got cleansed as it went through the community. And then when it went into the next tribe's community, it got toxic again. But in that place, it was actually whole, clean, fresh water. And this isn't just some fairy tale. They've had scientists go down there and study why when I'm on this side of the border is it toxic and I'm on this side of it, it's absolutely clean, refreshed water. No, that's not where they do it. But <laughs> Okay, so what happened with the coral reef? Not only did it attract the fish when they go out to fish. Now, this almost sounds too good to be true, but this is how we don't understand how the universe is set up. The fish swim into the nets instead of them throwing the nets out to catch them. They literally just w put the nets on the beach and the fish swim into it and then they just take them and eat them for that day. Wow, wow talk about easy. Okay, what is that? <laughs> That's just mankind. This is what Jesus has done for us because we haven't seen it. When we read certain passages, we think, well, that must be... That must not be true. That must be a spiritualized statement because we haven't seen it in our lives, but we're assuming that God doesn't do those things, and he does. He says that if he can find someone to come into agreement with him, he'll heal the land you live in, guys. So how does that translate to you and I here in um, Castle Rock? That means everything you put your hand to, you should have the recognized blessing of the Lord on it Amen. to where people are actually shocked. Look how much they're blessed. It means you should have crops. If you're growing, if you grow crops, they should be blessed. Everything you touch should be, have the blessing. Remember when he said, I'm going to bless you when you come in and go out? This is what the mark of my people is. And we just read that and think, oh, I mean, God must have just been saying that, but it might never be true. If he can find someone that will come into alignment with him, he does this stuff all the time. He just can't find anyone to come into agreement with him about his plans for things. I mean, I'm just telling you one story. I could go into Guatemala where the whole town has been converted and their crops are humongous and they produce them four times a year and they can't get it anywhere else in Guatemala, just that town where everyone's turned to the Lord. 
I mean, it's just unbelievable. Are you guys getting it? If he can find someone to come into agreement with him on something, he'll change everything to reflect his kingdom. This is why when I sit in a class like this, I can't figure out why there isn't 5,000 Christians sitting in here with me right. figuring this out. I mean, this is what's going to change. This is what changes everything. Uh, prayer, if you guys haven't figured this out yet, I'll say it now just to kind of really make life a lot easier. If you're struggling with the power of your flesh to bring the blessing of God, you're going into the wrong arena to do it. You need to learn how prayer works. It changes everything everything. It is the most powerful thing that Jesus has actually given you. Isn't that amazing to say that to you guys? It will heal people. It will transform families. It will change nations. It will bring heaven on earth however God wants to release it. That's why it's so powerful. That's why the Bible wants you to know your authority. You have authority in the spirit realm. You have authority in the natural realm. You have authority over all the animals. Uh, you have authority. Now we just have to learn to exercise it. How does authority work? All right. You guys, so here's the concept of dominion, all right? Let me give you that, and then we'll finish up, all right? Concept of dominion. Let's see. So when God says, I've given you dominion, it also can be translated the rule. And it's the word marsha. Does that sound like a marshal to you? Marshal? That's where we get the word marshal. It comes from the Hebrew word marsha. And, it, and you guys, it's interesting. If you don't like the word dominion, if that sounds like uh, in how imperious ruled people by evil of wickedness, well, then just use the word governor because that's how it's translated also. You're the governor. Or you're the steward. And everyone likes that one. But some reason, when you tell people you're the steward of the earth, they think they have no authority. So the best way to know how to say it is God has created you and said, you're the governor and wherever I've placed you, and you decide how much heaven you want wherever you're at. You decide. Now we go, no, that's not true. God decides. Well, God really wants to bless you and your family. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Okay, so if God has that plan for your family and it's not being actualized, is it God keeping it from you? <laughs> I'm sorry? No, I, I'm not trying to say it's your fault. I'm just no, asking you a question. You yeah, and I want you guys to think about this. Remember all the stuff I was telling you about those third world nations that are having the Lord move powerfully? Do you know what else is going on in those nations? They're under a major prayer movement going on right now. They take prayer so seriously that they dedicate mountains to prayer. They, when they do retreats, all they do is spend 48 hours praying and fasting to get the Lord to move. We, now guys, I, I don't want to say this to hurt anybody's feeling because not everybody in America thinks this way. But on the scale of 0 to 10 in importance, because we tend to be mostly fleshly in our thinking, we believe that the most important thing is what I do with the power of my money, my ability, and my effort. And so I take the physical as reality, and that's where I need to learn how to control it. Okay, and after I exhaust all that, I might pray. So we put prayer down in one, two, or three in importance in our Christian walk, where the Bible actually says you should actually have this as a foundation. When, when David said, I am prayer, he didn't say I pray, he said, I am prayer. He's saying, look, if you, don't, if you haven't figured this out yet, the world comes from the spirit realm into the natural realm. The natural realm doesn't affect the spirit. And everyone says, well, doesn't it say the flesh first and then the spirit? You have to understand the totality of how the Bible describes it. If everything came from the spirit and created the physical, then it's the spiritual world that has the most power. It has the most authority, and it's where everything comes from. Yes. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. And so if you, if, if you realize that, you stop putting this as the, this ends up responding to the, phys, the spiritual realm instead of you doing everything till you're totally burned out and then you turn to the spirit and say, well, oh God, oh, my life falling apart. <laughs> right? How, how is that legal? Instead of the What's that? Thing, it's the last yeah. Do that so, one again? Yeah, no, I'm not going to do that one again. And so, when, one of the biggest shocks I had is the first time I stepped out of Western culture into the other parts of the world. And every conflict they have, they start with something's going on in the spirit. You're going, well, no, you had a flat tire. And they're like, well, yeah, but you're assuming that the spirit realm has nothing to do with this. Well, do you know in your culture you're taught as a child that really 
The spirit realm has no, well, first, our culture doesn't even believe in the spirit realm. And if you do, it has no interaction except making you feel happy or sad. Like, it doesn't affect anything physical. Really, it's kind of silly. And so since we think like that, we always go to that as the last resort, and it's always in desperation. So most believers in Western Christianity think prayer, you only really access true authority is when you're totally desperate, <laughs> totally out of your wits, and you've exhausted everything in the physical realm. That's when prayer works. And, that, and the reason why it works in Western culture is that's what it takes a Western Christian to get to the place where they finally discover prayer works. Well, what you don't have to go to the place of utter desperation, and you could tap into it anyways because you just figure out your authority. And you give yourself to this process. Now, I stand in front of you guys, and I say things that are, I think, I wonder, how are you hearing me when I say this? Jesus, uh, several years ago, started coming to me and, and told me, Hey, Brian, when I have you pray for your political leaders, it, I don't care about the party. I care about righteousness. And I'm going to tell you how to pray for them, and I want you to watch me answer your prayer. And I have watched the Lord do that. Now he's told me, now I want you to take your attention. He told me this after the last election cycle. I still pray for this stuff. But he said, I want you to take your attention off that. There are five areas of government. Do you guys realize that? From the scripture that you have authority in. Two of them, the church hardly ever prays for. You guys ready? One is media and the other are teachers in the land. And so the Lord told me, I want to change the culture of what in Christianity. So I want you to start praying for the media that if they will not turn towards righteousness, that they will be defunded and I will raise up godly media in this nation. And the same thing with teachers because they affect generations. Do you guys realize that? The most of the filth that hits the whole world comes out of this culture, out of our media. And we're all sitting around going, we need to stop this. We need to stop it at the source. It's the media. That's how the prince of the power of the air gets his influence is through media. So, so the Lord just told me, You're, you, have a, you have authority in that area. Now go after it. So guys, have you been watching any of this stuff? As Hollywood tanks, I'm rejoicing because my prayers are being answered. Amen. <laughs> Don't forget the main thing that we covered this time. You were made to be in the physical realm, and you're made to be in the spiritual realm. Our job is not to go out of balance one way or the other. It's learning to understand how the kingdom works. God says that he's given us, us the legal authority. If you take away anything this evening, realize that. You have the legal authority for things that are going on in your life. You are not to be taken advantage of. God has created you to recognize that every bad thing that comes along, you have to make a decision about it. Now, how do you deal with it is the big thing. I believe prayer is the answer for that stuff. So can I pray with you guys real quick? Let's pray. I thank you, Lord, that it's amazing that this has been going on for thousands of years, and yet here we are in our time in history needing to learn these things. Would you give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation that we would understand the hope of our calling in you? Even in prayer, let us discover our identity here, Lord. And for my brothers and sisters in this room, I command the blessing of the Lord upon them. Bring your peace, your love, and your... Let them, literally, in a sense, Lord, take the veils away from our eyes and let us see reality. Let us understand who we are in you. And I bless you guys with the peace of the Lord right now. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.